Welcome to Coffee and Contemplation, a Stranger Things podcast. I'm Robin. I'm Heidi. And today we'll be discussing Chapter 7, The Bite. Welcome back. <laughs> I'm very happy to have you back. Oh. Uh, especially because we didn't necessarily know if you were going to be back for just the finale or if come yeah. back for, for Chapter 7. So, Yay! So our our coffee selections for today are once again just like in the f- the first episode our theme not coffee no we went to a little local place that we both have a lot of fondness for it's the North Market Pop Shop which specializes in like I mean they just have this wall of sodas and of all brands from all over the country and most of them are normal but some of them are absolutely wild there was a butter flavored one a mustard flavored one that I noticed today. It's, I mean, it's a little place, but it's the selection is enormous. And so I got a, uh, I'm, for the first time, I'm trying a Reading Draft root beer. I got a black cherry. I have drank all of it already because I got a float, but I was drawn to it because it's black cherry and was also in uh, like English and French. So I must have the thing that has French on it for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, and very important question. What flavor ice cream did you get? Oh, chocolate. Naturally. So it's a black. So it's sort of like a black ch- black cherry chocolate. Yeah. And we decided to go to the pop shop um, a because we like it, <laughs> and b because we thought in this episode they're at the movie theater and it's sort of a, a tradition to get soda when you go to the movie theater. So mm-hmm. let's get let's have soda. Yeah. Well, now that we've acquired coffee, let us proceed with contemplation. So something I realize I haven't been doing much this season is tracking the the seamlessness between episodes. So this one doesn't this one doesn't it entirely like deviate, but it doesn't we it doesn't pick up exactly where the last one left off. The last one we left that amazing sequence with L facing off with Billy Flair. Mm-hmm. And Billy Flair, I want to give credit where it's due. That was a term you came up with way back in 2019. Oh, really? Yeah. And it's perfect. <laughs> this one though, we open at the fun fair to John Mellencamp's, I don't know if it's, te- I don't know, I'm not familiar with the song, so I don't know if it's technically R-O-C-K in the USA or if it's just rock in the USA. I'm going to guess the former. Again, with that heavy, like, America. Yeah. But then again, this actually is the 4th of July, so it makes at least a little bit more sense here. We have this, you know, massive 4th of July celebration, which was also kind of nostalgic to me. Both Karen's dress and there was this one, like, random mom in, like, the background shots of everybody, like, buying cotton candy and whatnot. My mom had two dresses, both of which looked exactly like these dresses that these women were wearing. Oh, interesting. And it was just this, like, frying pan to the head of nostalgia. <laughs> Very unexpected. But I do remember going to, like, little fairs and things like that, you know, when you're a kid and whatnot. But to have that very, like, America kind of atmosphere and also to have ROCK in the USA and then to have when Mayor Klein comes up, I saw in the subtitles, it's like the Washington Post March was playing. We've all heard it like six gazillion times and have him be very much like, are you ready to see some fireworks and like whipping everybody up when he's absolutely working with the communists? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not subtle in the same way that, you know, the first episode wasn't subtle. But I think this is also satirical, Mm. whereas the first episode was just not. Part of the reason that they're able to go for satire and not just like James Bond pastiche is because the Duffers are a lot more familiar with American culture and they're a lot more familiar with American corruption in politicians and even what Murray says later on in the episode where he's like, all of the games are rigged. Yeah. And then he says like, that's, that's America. So I think there is a level of like satire and commentary going on even with the fun fair that wasn't present even in like like the first couple of the scenes with the mall i wonder to a degree if this is really what they were more interested in Mm -hmm. and so much of the beginning was sort of like we don't we don't really know what to do until we get to that stuff yeah and it's unfortunate because i actually think that if they had applied some of this energy to some of that it could have been better yeah the scene, though, of Ted, Karen, and Holly on the Ferris wheel absolutely melts my heart. I love it. It's like, so sweet. The whole, like, why do you two like to torture me? Because it's fun. <laughs> I don't know if they intended it this way, but I kind of think it does this, like, circular acknowledgement or, like, kind of coming full circle 
I don't really know how to phrase it exactly, considering what Karen was going to do in, yeah. the, in the beginning of the season, like, it's not true. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, she's teasing him in this, like, kind of fun way. Yeah. And I don't know. I actually thought that was kind of a really and, beautiful moment. Yeah. No, I very much agree. And the fact that he's not, he's clearly not actually scared. I mean, I can also tell that he's not like a Ferris wheel enthusiast, <laughs> yeah. as it were. <laughs> <laughs> but he's not like, he doesn't feel like he's actually in danger or anything like that. So he's saying, like, why do you two love to torture me? Just playfully, in the same way that Holly and Karen are. Karen is very much in this place of trying to, I don't want to say trying to rekindle the romance or anything like that, but I think she's reinvesting in the life that she already has. Even the fact that she would think to slip a five to the guy so that they can watch the fireworks up there, like, that's really, that's a really thoughtful thing to do. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I like it too. And then, yeah, when, when Mayor Klein gives that speech, I can't help but think about the, uh, the again, the gag reel. Because apparently, Carrie always, like, it's it's not, like, a huge, like, he bungles the line, like, in any, like, big way. But he kind of just goes, well, I, uh, <clears throat> and he, like, clears his throat <laughs> and then just, like, walks back off. And I love, out, I love moments like that in gag reels because the audience actually laughs. Because mm-hmm. they're real people. They're yeah. just extras. So, and it, but, but it also, like, I think about moments like that and I suddenly get, like, very intimidated. And I'm like, wow, like, hats off to you. Because that's, like, he had to, act, like, not only is he delivering that speech, like, in front of the cameras. But he has to do it in front of an actual audience. Yeah. And then to have them all laugh at you, like, if you make a mistake, like, I mean, good naturally. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think he was, like, laughed off stage or anything like that. But it was just, like, really cute. I don't know. I like, I like outtakes like that. I actually think watching gag reels is important for a number of reasons. One is that they're delightful. And another is that it's so easy for us as an audience, especially as an audience member who is not in the film industry, does not know anything about, like, how movies and television are made, and, you know, so it just comes to us, like, prepackaged, you know, and even with the effort that I have put into learning about how movies and television are made, I still find myself kind of in that headspace just kind of automatically like oh yeah like first this happens and then this happens and they film it all in sequential order of course they do and you know other like mistakes I don't even know I'm making so it would be super super easy for me as an audience member to assume that like he did that all in one take because it's just natural that's his job etc etc but seeing the gag reel kind of it makes it it makes the process so much less esoteric Mm, mm -hmm. and it also brings filmmakers of all kinds like down off of a pedestal that I don't think they're even trying to be on so seeing you know Carrie was like we know he's got a very long and rich career and seeing him just be like I was mm, hold on (laughs) I'm gonna do that again (laughs) yeah yeah is is very humanizing it humanizes the acting process and the movie making process in like a really nice way and then on the Ferris wheel, Holly sees that the trees are moving. Yes. That was one of my favorite moments of the episode, actually. I don't know if that was true, you know, like the first time I was watching through the season, but it definitely was as I was prepping for this conversation. It would have been very easy for Holly to miss that. Certainly Ted and Karen do. The way that Holly's face is shot in that moment, and of course the music as well. Light from the fireworks being like reflected off of her face and being reflected in her eyes. But at the same time, she's just got this expression where she's realizing that something is really, really wrong. Like it's not a breeze. Something bad is happening. There's so much nonverbal that's going on right in that moment. And she reminds me so much of first season Mike being so incredibly intuitive. I think all three of the Wheeler children are just like vastly intuitive. Well, I mean, think about it in, in season one. She was the one who followed the lights mm-hmm. into the into the bedroom. So yeah. and Joyce was like, you saw something. Yeah. And she's like, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She, yeah. I forgot that. She is a Wheeler child. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's also, like, some symbolism going on there of, like, you know, she's tucked in between her two parents. It's supposed to be something, like, really cool and exciting. Now, I was, when I was Holly's age, I did not like fireworks. 
I still don't like fireworks. I did not like loud noises. If my mom and dad had pulled a stunt like that, there would have been crying. <laughs> it would not have been that now they wouldn't have because they knew that I was afraid of fireworks. But yeah, like she's supposed to be in like the most safe and secure place that she could be. And yet there's this like invasion from outside forces. It's just it's a really, really cool little moment. Yeah. I agree. Well, also, like, I mean, to your point about, like, how it's shot and how how she performs it, it's kind of like, she also doesn't look away. She's entirely focused. Like, she never looks up and then back or whatever, at least as I recall. So it's a very, like, no, I'm dead focused on this. Mm -hmm. Also, trees are moving. Reminded me of the Scottish play. Like, did you think that also? Did it remind you of Macbeth? Because I was like, I thought it was just me being, like, a nerd. I thought it was accidental. But do you think maybe it was intentional? I also think it's possibly... You know, they're working with Lord of the Rings, but Lord of the Rings is a reference to Macbeth. I think it's probably more directly a reference to Macbeth. Yeah. Title sequence. And we come out of that title sequence to Hopper's Cabin, where we actually pick up where the last episode ended. The kids, plus Nancy and Jonathan, are theorizing that the building of the army is to stop Eleven. We only have one more episode to go. I haven't watched ahead. Like, I haven't watched the finale yet. But there's this question, there's ongoing question of, like, tracking when do we actually get information about what's going on? Mm -hmm. Going into season three, there was this sense of we never really get a lot of answers. There's a lot of lack of information this season. And up until now, there's been moments of where they they will go, well, how does that make sense? And someone goes, well, we don't know. We just have to assume the worst. And it's like, but then they never circle back to that again. Set up without payoff. So... Here, I remember they started doing this, con- they started having this conversation, and I remember going, okay, are we actually going to get some answers here? They come to the conclusion that the Mind Flayer has shifted to building this army to get L. As Jenna said in Chapter 2, what was its goal before that? It, something you said after we had watched all of the season back in 2019, you said the fact that it was so ambiguous, it, we should have more details by this point. We should, but I'm wondering if... The Upside Down is just evil, and it wants to be here, and it wants to hurt people. Elle keeps finding ways to stop it, so they have developed a very, like, combative, you know, directly combative relationship. But also, like, they were always tied because she was the one who opened the gate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. However, I stand by, if it was me, (laughs) if it it was me who said, we're three seasons and it should not be this obtuse, then I stand by that. If it was somebody else, then I agree. Melty Beast. Yeah. He does not teach us anything about the Upside Down. Mm-mm. He does not teach us about what the Upside Down is actually, like, what do they want? We as an audience at season three should be able to understand what the Upside Down is, what it wants, what we can do, like, you know, at least on some level, or even the parameters that prevent us from fully eradicating it because you need like you know at stage you know in act three of four you need that like we're facing down the armies of mordor outside the gates of minas tirith kind of moment i would like to know about what is the upside down well where does it come from where do we go cotton eye joe i I have no idea (laughs) i'm just not personally as interested in something that like, not even so much, like, from a mustache twisty perspective, but, like, in the sense of, I just want to kill everything and eat everything. Okay, well, once you do that, then what? Yeah, I mean, I think if you're, you know, if you're the mind flayer, like, maybe this is not the only dimension that, you know, you have ever taken over. Oh. And maybe you want to take over many, many dimensions. I am about to make a reference to Independence Day. There's a bunch of aliens. Basically, what they say is, like, we just go from, like, planet to planet that has resources that we like and we take it over and we kill everything and we use up all the resources and then we move along and then we find the next one and then we kill everything there that could be what the mind flayer is and that would be that would be legit Mm -hmm. like that would be fine l mentions that uh he also threatened to kill all of them yeah that conversation is so interesting l's immediate reaction wasn't okay hey we gotta go even when nancy said wait, so you had that conversation in this room? And Will's like, wait, shit. 
I actually really like the way the fight scene plays out. Same. But I can't, I really can't help but wonder why they didn't haul ass and just leave. Like, even though, like, they took all the time to even, like, put furniture in front of the door. I think Nancy got some, like, gasoline as well as a shotgun. Mm -hmm. Why? You've got the keys. <laughs> they leave at the end of the fight yep. scene. Yep. Mm-hmm. <sighs> they, yeah, they put it together and they go out and they see it. We cut back to the the mall, but while we're here, let's just go ahead and talk about the yeah. sequence. Because in a way, the fact that they cut back to the scoop troop and then cut back to this mm -hmm. implies a delay of time. Mm -hmm. Now maybe it's not parallel action, but it's kind of, but it, it adds this feeling that there's this like wait. Well, I remember as I was watching the episode, because they can see it really clearly, mm -hmm. it's like maybe 100 yards out. Yeah. You know, and they have all this time to be like moving, you know, rearranging furniture and shit. And I'm like, did Jinsis just be like, <laughs> okay, hold on. One minute. One minute. Well, well, or the mind flare is like, uh, I'm so excited, but I'm, I'm going to give you guys a head start. I'm just yeah. going to hang out <laughs> here for a minute and just wait. Just like, like a video, like a character in a video game, just like hovering, uh -huh. waiting. Like, all right. Go ahead. Get ready. <laughs> I'm so confident. I'm going to just let you guys prepare. Mm -hmm. I mean, because it doesn't end up making much of an impact. The thing tears right through the roof. Like, yeah. it doesn't... But yeah, I had the same... It, this is the same sequence from the end of season two when Elle came back. Mm -hmm. Granted, season two had, had moments that were influenced from season one. But this is clearly a, a follow-up to that. Yeah. Because the Demodogs were halfway... They were all the way at Hawkins Lab. They knew they had that built-in time. Like, they see the Mind Flare. It's not that far. My other question is, how come they don't hear it? Like, does yeah. it send its tendrils out from 100 yards away? And maybe that's the idea, but eventually it does show up. Now, granted, it does eventually tear the roof off and, and is above them. And maybe you don't hear the boom, 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 because there's so much else going on. And it gets lost in that, in the sound mix. But if it's knocking trees down, how do it, they not hear the... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Logistically, digging at the detail perspective, this scene doesn't really work. But I gotta say, I like it anyway. No, I totally love it. It's great. W once the fight starts, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't yeah. actually love the build up that much. It's yeah. kind of again because I got lost in the how is, how is this working? Why are you not leaving? Yeah, because they're all standing outside in front of the fucking car. Yep, looking at this thing coming towards them. Yeah, I mean the only thing that happens is that L does rip its head in half. Yes, so that allows them time to get away. Yes, but if they had all that time to prep, they had time to get. So, but I guess. Uh, yeah, I, that's the only way that that ending, like, you can't airlift the fight out. No. So, and, and that think, counts. And I also think that despite everyone but Elle being very ineffectual against the monster, I do think that it's important to keep showing that they are all there. They're all with her. Mm -hmm. None of them give even a fraction of a thought mm -hmm. to abandoning her. Mm -hmm. They all know that they're no match for this monster, and they fight it anyway. Mm -hmm. Jonathan picks up an axe and is just like, all right, let's do this. I especially loved the axe because that felt like a callback to Joyce. Yes. Yeah. So I think that's really, really, really important character work. And also, like, they get to see that Elle is really struggling. Mm -hmm. You know, like, especially when she's dealing with both of those tendrils. So for plot mechanics, in that scene, there did need to be a sequence when it got hold of her leg. Mm -hmm. The bite. <laughs> yeah, the bite. <laughs> the tissular bite. That did have to happen. I just think that, like, the setup could have been... And even, like, you know, the how it was shot mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the effects themselves. And, I mean, I have been very much on record that there are some ooey, gooey, greasy, grimy gopher guts yeah. stuff in this season that I just am not interested in looking at. Yeah. Like, that fight sequence yeah. was actually really fun and really cool to watch. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to say, like, well, this is just spectacle, or largely spectacle, I'm here for this kind of spectacle. Mm. I like the spectacle of this fight, because it's, you see Nancy with that shotgun, yeah, and you see Lucas then picks up the axe, and you see them holding her, and, like, the way it's edited, and the way, the, the pacing of it is great. Once the fight starts, you can really get lost in not thinking about whether or not it makes sense, or whether yeah. or not it has any, like, whether or not there was a better way for them to handle It's like, no, you just get caught up in it. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. And I, I do love that we're getting so many, again, to borrow your term from the end of season one, these, like, hero shots of Lucas. Mm -hmm. And especially to have, like, him on the one side with the axe, and then Nancy on the other side with the gun. It's just, it's handled so beautifully. Yeah. Yeah, this is a standout scene for me. 
Dustin and Erica drive the still drugged Steve and Robin. <laughs> the babies. <laughs> they come to this to the stop and reboard the elevator and Stephen Robin's antics perplex Dustin and Erica because they they still don't technically know. Yeah. They're trying to figure out what's happened to them and formulate a plan so that they can get all of them to safety. Made all the more difficult since, as Steve tells Dustin, the Russians took the car keys, which is a bummer, right? But I love that, and it's so it's so much in character how quickly Dustin figures out exactly what happened. Erica is the one who says, like, are they drunk? How could they be drunk? And then once we're in the elevator, he actually, like, diagnoses Steve. He looks at his eyes. He checks out and sees that he has a fever. He's very, like, scientific and methodical. But also, you know, because he's Dustin, he's very empathetic about it and understanding and plays into, like, you can have all the food you want yep. if you tell me where the car is. You're such a bard. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's kind of a cleric moment, but whatever. In terms of the positives, I uh, laughed pretty hard with Dustin's response to Robin's, we all die, my strange little friend. <laughs> like, he just stops, considers, and then totally disregards it and just turns back to Steve. Like, <laughs> like, dude, Matarazzo, like, just nailing the understated comedic timing of that. Yes. At the same time, like, this whole section of this of this episode, it feels like a... It, like, it rings a vaguely familiar bell of, like, an 80s and or 90s trope with the kids and parents, like, swapping roles. I feel like that was a thing we saw a lot in the yeah. 90s. And I've never been terribly fond of that. Like, to me, this shtick gets old fast. Yes. But to be fair, it does end fairly fast. Yes. And that was something I think the first time I watched it, it felt like it went on for fucking ever. ever. <laughs> and it doesn't. Well, and I think also, like, the first time you watch it, the first time I watched it, I was irrationally and, and unfairly, in the same way that I would be if this were, like, a real situation, pretty annoyed with Stephen Robin. Like, would you shut up and try to focus and, like, you understand that your actual life is in danger? Can you, like, get your shit together? Because I'm worried about them as characters. Yeah, I don't want yeah. anything more bad. I don't to happen to them. I don't want them to get caught by the Russians again. Right. It heightens the intensity of their antics. Like, if they just, like, I'm not suggesting this is in their characterization, but if they just, like, got high, mm -hmm. this would probably be funny because of, like, their, like, surfing on the rolly thing and, like, yeah, so, like, it would all be a lot more harmless. But the fact that you have this added level of peril I think makes it feel a lot intenser and a lot longer. I think my concern when we watched it together the first time was, is this the version of Steve and Robin we're going to get for the rest of the episode? Is this the version of Steve and Robin we're going to get in the finale? Are they mm -hmm. just going to be high through the rest of it? And also it felt again like we were opting for comedy at a point when things are really pretty dire. Now, I don't know that I agree with that perspective anymore, mm -hmm. because I actually do think that lightening the mood, especially in between the the conversation in, in Hopper's cabin and then the actual fight actually does add a little bit of a, a breather, which I think is kind of kind of a good thing. And also, for what it's worth, I don't dislike it as much as I might precisely because it's Steve and Robin based on just Hawk and Carrie's natural, like their individual charisma and then their chemistry together makes it a lot more palatable than it might have been. Mm -hmm. Like, I like them. Like, I found myself smiling at some of those interactions when I was like, this is stupid, but it's funny anyway. <laughs> like, because I like them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As they get back into the mall, they sneak into the movie theater, and Dustin and Erica debate the, the plan of simply lying low. But Dustin takes the walkie-talkie and tries to get a ride. And I, I said this last episode, but it, it's just so... I don't even know what the word is. It's just I find myself noticing, we're in the penultimate episode. The Scoose Troop know nothing mm -hmm. about any of the stuff with the... Like, it's kind of incredible that they're still so separate. And then, for something completely different, we catch up with Alexi, Murray, Hop, and Joyce flying down the highway discussing how to turn off the machine. At least until Hopper and Joyce get into yet another argument. And that's when Murray has to interrupt to deliver his, his truth bomb. What did you think of this? Murray reading the room in season two was really, really effective for a couple reasons. One, Murray is an adult. Jonathan and Nancy are teenagers, so therefore they're a lot easier to read. I think it worked kind of unexpectedly well. It was a fan favorite, and so they decided to do it again. I don't even necessarily want us the romantic tension. I don't know if I'm prepared to actually comment on whether or not Joyce and Hopper have sexual tension and to what degree. 
But that's what Murray is saying here. But that is what he's saying here. But also he's talking about like the feelings that are there. He says like, oh, you two have sexual feelings for each other. But really what he means is that they have romantic feelings for each other. And I wish he had leaned on that. Now, the reading the room thing. You're drawn to him, but you want somebody who is nice because you had a bad relationship and you are worried about opening up to somebody because that didn't go well last time. Uh, that I could have actually done without. Not because it wasn't insightful, but because we all know that already. And I think that there was a, I think the reason it worked better with Jonathan and Nancy is because it was, because Murray was saying things that we as an audience had like kind of picked up on, but that we weren't explicitly already very aware of now the whole thing of like you two bickering and this like bizarre and like secondhand embarrassing mating ritual is getting on my nerves either stop or make out that i actually thought was funny that's a good point it did shut them up but the, but the whole thing is too much of a good thing but i love and adore when he sits back and Alexi's like, what was all that about? It's like, oh, I was telling them to have sex. They haven't had sex. <laughs> That's amazing. That part's great. Yeah. 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 I, I think the reason that, that that button on the end of it is so great is because, A, it is very different from what happened in season two. Yeah. I know it's super funny and I like it and I laugh at it and I think it's great for a comedic note, but I actually think it's a really key point of Murray and Alexi becoming friends because yeah. to me it says Murray is realizing, oh, dude, like you can keep up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's a moment of, like, actual, like, I don't think it's just, like, oh, isn't this funny? Which would be fine anyway. Yeah. But I really liked that about it. Yeah. For me, the rest of the scene, like a lot of other things in this season, it's the presentation. I don't like that he has to scream this at them on the highway because they're in the car. It's consistent. To me, so much of what made that sequence in season two so so compelling is how deft it mm -hmm. is. It's very quiet. It's understated. It's more like it progresses the story mm -hmm. or at least progresses the character development. And to me, I think in season two, it didn't feel, I don't know why I'm so sensitive to this, but I find that I really get, ve I bristle very easily when anything kind of brushes against being insulting to Bob. I find that really upsetting. And I don't know that that's probably mostly a me thing, but I find that something about the way that Murray and, and I love Murray, don't get me wrong. He's one of my favorite characters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the way that he says that about, like, you want someone stable. And, and like, basically he describes Bob. Yeah. And it's like, but that's not good enough for you. And you know, it has this very, like, that's not, you're, that's not worthy of you. Or that's not good enough. Or that's, that's pointless and that's stupid. And it, but I don't like it. I really don't. I feel like they could have handled that in a way that didn't have to be disrespectful to Bob's memory. Mm-hmm. Especially because it's like, I don't think that it's unreasonable for Joyce to want those things. Yeah. Especially considering how fucking unstable Hopper has been this whole season. Yeah. Especially considering that Murray's parting line to Joyce is, but you're really curious to know what he'd be like in the sack. That feels like then that diminishes their relationship. So it's mm. interesting to me that you picked up on the fact that he's, that you read it as him saying it's romantic tension. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It, it feels to me like they were like, well, we got to do that again. Where can we stick this moment? Yeah. In the car because they're not doing anything else. And it just, but it ends up having this like... I'm going to scream this at you. Yeah. Like everything else this season, it's over the top and blown out of bro It's I don't know. Yeah. I mean, am, am I way off about the Bob thing? No. But I think what he's saying there is not so much like Bob was boring. He's saying like, you think you're looking for something, something or someone other than Hopper, but you are very drawn to Hopper. You think he's very sexy and you are mad about it. <laughs> So you have, like, an idea in your head of what you want that's, like, the opposite of Hopper, but Hopper is who you, who you actually have feelings for. I wish he had been more, like, if he had started off with, the, like, children, children, like, hey, we've got, like, a lot that needs to be handled here. But if he saw them getting uncomfortable and was like, listen, Joyce, mm -hmm. I can see that this is a difficult thing for you whatever, whatever. If he had been more gentle about it, mm -hmm. I think it could have worked better. But he's also frustrated in the same way we are. Yeah. 
which is a really good point. Again, like they've said, they've said and done some not great things to one another mm-hmm. this season. And it's kind of like, I'm fine with that to an extent. It just feels like neither of them get held accountable for it. Yeah. Uh, there's not a lot of getting held accountable at all in this season. Yeah. But speaking of Jonathan and Nancy, sort of, um, <laughs> that group arrives at Bradley's Big Buy for supplies for Elle's very serious injury. And Max schools them in knowing how to treat it, stop the bleeding, then clean, then disinfect, then bandage, because she skateboards. And I love that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how accurate any of that is, but I like it. I love the way that Max takes charge. I also love that she leaves Mike in charge of holding the bandage, you know, on Elle's leg. Whatever is going on between them, Max knows that Elle trusts Mike and blah, blah, blah. While Lucas and Will are looking for a washcloth and bowl, they stumble onto the fireworks display. Conveniently one that's basically a bomb, according to Lucas. I kind of love that Lucas and Will are sort of useless when it comes to, (laughs) like, finding supplies. Yeah. I don't know how realistic I find it. Like, wasn't Lucas the one who had, like, an entire, like, survival kit in Uh season one? But I fully understand why Max is like, you fucking dumbass. Can you do what I tell you to do one time? But at the same time, Lucas is finding the fireworks and wanting to use them on the flayed is genius yeah because the whole like you know the whole reason that l can't make a dent is because it keeps coming apart and then flowing back together whereas if you have like a whole crap ton of fireworks then it's being attacked from many 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 different angles Mm -hmm. i like the way lucas thinks in that sequence well especially since i mean one thing that occurs to me is also like it's a new idea like Mm -hmm. because one thing that that i I didn't say about the fight earlier is that like yeah like they can't actually beat this thing with the shotgun and the axe because as we talked about at the end of season one it's like how do you kill this thing bullets you know it gets hit with machine with a machine gun and it doesn't slow the demogorgon down this is the mind flare yeah how do you kill it and, and and this is not actually a criticism even of the show or the characters necessarily, but they keep bringing the same knife to the same gunfight. Elle will take care of it. She, to be, she does, but not in a way that's going to like inflict any lasting damage. Well, and she's all they have. And yeah. it's like if she gets taken down, they're SOL. Yeah. And yeah, this leaves Mike and Elle alone to talk, allowing Mike to apologize and struggle with telling her directly that he's in love with her i know it's so funny you know they say it makes you crazy what mike what what you've never heard that expression (laughs) which was funny to me because i was like dude of all people i think you would probably know that she hasn't heard most like euphemisms and common expressions yeah like she's she's heard almost nothing uh apparently uh this exchange was largely if not entirely improvised by wolfhard Oh my god. That's precious. And I and I'm curious to know what actually was scripted just as a curiosity. Like what what did he do differently? I do like especially the exchange of bitchin because my headcanon is that that means that L has told him where he, she heard that expression, which is to say he knows all about Kali. Mhm. But before and maybe Mike would have worked up to it, but before he can do that, he hears Dustin on the walkie back to by the musical score from Back to the Future. <laughs> but the transmission is garbled because the battery is low. I actually really love this moment. The relief on both sides is so yes. is so cute. And I, I just, I love how much joy it brings me. And Dustin reconvenes with Erica just in time to realize that Steve and Robin have disappeared. <laughs> and they're still drugged, trying to make sense of the movie. And then they look up amazed at the ceiling until they have to run to the bathroom to puke. Back at the fun fair, Hop and Joyce go looking for their kids, and Hop demands that Murray stay behind with Alexi, who he again calls Smirnoff. Klein spots Hopper and immediately calls the the commie bastards Mm -hmm. on his enormous cell phone, I think? Or was it a car phone? I couldn't quite tell. Great question. Satellite phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at the big buy, Elle searches for Dustin while Lucas delivers his new Coke commercial. I I know everyone's talked about this. But why the ever-loving fuck is this in this? Is it commentary? Is it a meta thing? I I don't know. I don't know. And then on the way out of the big buy, loaded up with fireworks, they debate the situation some more, whether Dustin said great or gate, and how they need to close the gate again if it's open, which would explain, and they have the fireworks as a backup. 
Camera swings back around inside the store, though, in a top-down shot of the mess they left behind with bandages and Elle's blood on the floor, which starts to, like, shift and boil. I found that really odd. Well, I think it's infected blood. Maybe the reason that the whole new Coke commercial was in there was so that they could work in a conversation about the thing because um, oh. for the blood and at the end, the whatever the fuck that thing is under Elle's skin is straight out of the thing. And then in another bizarre sort of match cut, we return to Starcourt where Steve and Robin seem to be sobering up to be sure they interrogate each other. I really love, like, very early on in the beginning of the scene, I love the exchange about Nancy. She's such a press. Turns out, not really. Mm -hmm. Like, that really kind of sums it up. Yeah. Like, I love that. I thought that was actually a surprisingly, like, short, quick, punchy way to describe Nancy. Yeah. (laughs) And her arc over the course of the, the three seasons. Steve tells Robin that he likes her, and Robin admits that she likes him too, though not in the same way, which is a real surprise even to her. She recounts how much she hated him in school, partly because he was so awful and partly because he got all the attention from Tammy Thompson, the girl she liked, revealing that she's a lesbian. Steve is surprised, but accepts it, and thus, Louis, I believe this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. (laughs) Okay. Uh, (laughs) So, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that this scene has had a pretty profound impact on my life. But before we get into that... I really do love every bit of this scene. I think it's crafted really, really well. And I love that this development came primarily from Hawk and Kiri. I I love how everything that Steve says prior to the big reveal is genuine. Mm -hmm. Like, I think it, and I think it tracks regardless of how the scene ends. The way that this scene plays out doesn't feel forced. It doesn't feel tacked on. Because all of this that he says about, like, I should have been hanging out with her the whole time, like... All of that is still true. It's still true. And a good portion of this early little bit is him kind of talking about how much more there just is to life. Yeah. And it's a lot of like the culmination of what he's realized over the course of the three seasons. And I think that's great. Yeah. And I I don't know about you, but I remember watching the scene being very much on the edge of my seat. This was a very like compelling. My first watch. I had heard whispers of like, oh my God, big spoiler around Robin, you know, but I didn't know. So... I remember like him making this like very sweet speech and I had thought that they had had romantic chemistry throughout the season. So I was not understanding why at at first why she was reacting in the way that she was because she seems upset and not like, you know, she doesn't seem like mad or scared, but she seems upset. And then once it became obvious, like, why and what was going on then I immediately shifted into I was anxious about it about what Steve's reaction was going to be just Mm because but also because I don't trust Stranger Things when it comes to queer characters they have historically not done a great job with representation Mm -hmm. talking about Billy talking about Will so I was just like where are we going because this could go in a lot of ways that would be really, really heartbreaking and also very offensive. But I think Kiri's performance is really, really important here. Because he does take a second to be like, oh, damn, well, I shot my shot and I'm getting rejected. But he doesn't make it about him. And then as you and I have talked off mic, like he very quickly moves to saying oh, Tammy's not good enough for you, but in such a way that it is very accepting. Like, she never says, I'm a lesbian. And he never says, I don't mind. That doesn't change (laughs) that I want to be your friend. Absolutely, yeah. None of that happens. He just goes straight into, A, telling her that he accepts her for who she is, and also, B, making it clear to her that he is not going to hold her rejecting him against her Mm -hmm. i mean that would be really really important even if she was rejecting him because she was straight and has a boyfriend from another school who cares whatever so i think that it was really really deftly written and really deftly acted this is another scene that stands out in this season is so much else is so over the top this is very grounded this is very very there's a lot of subtlety in play here 
this whole scene feels very organic. If you had told me they improvised this, that this was a scene they kind of figured out on the day, I'd be like, yeah, I believe that. Yeah, he processes so much so quickly. But not instantly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also a really important point because he has to say, oh, and then he sits there and just like stares into the middle distance for a good minute until she has to say, did you OD over there? And then he has to like kind of snap out of it and say, no. And then, and then the conversation moves forward. So he doesn't just immediately go, oh, wait, not her. Come on, we can do better than that for you. you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it's really well done. And that's what I mean by like, he takes a minute to process the rejection and also to process what he's heard, you know, maybe to think about what he's going to say next and, and so on, but not from a like, oh, well, it's not that I don't love you anymore. It's just that I have to think about how I want to be with you now that I know that you're not what I expected. It's it's not even that. It's It's, yeah, what I keep coming back to is that he doesn't make it about him. He does actually make this moment about her. And at the same time, it is a choice. I do think that part of his silence is him saying, so was everything I just said bullshit? Mm. I think he realizes both in terms of like, she's still all of the things he just said, and he can still have that relationship. It, it doesn't, it means they're going to be, it's a different relationship, but it's still a relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think, I just, I love this as a culmination of his of his arc of his journey like yeah. and this i think is a textbook example in the best way of that very classic piece of writing advice of how you need to give your characters wants and you need to have the characters searching for what they want but then you need to give them what they need mm -hmm. or present them with what they need because what he wants is a girlfriend what he needs is a friend mm -hmm. i th i think I, yeah. I choose to interpret it that way and that was not their intent they, they intended to give him a girlfriend. Yeah. But I think this ended up filling that kind of natural. I think that's the reason it works so well in terms of how they're going to move forward as friends. It's just, it's so beautiful. Yeah. I love it so much. I, I'm actually curious. Do you remember how I reacted? Did we pause it? Or did, did I like freak out at the end of the episode? Mm, we did pause it. You did not react well. Because I made it about me. And I made it about Steve. <laughs> I don't think you should worry about that. Because... This was a conversation that you were having with yourself about a piece of media that was very, very important to you. Here's what I mean fully, because I've also had a lot of time to, to process. I re this was when I realized that I relate to Steve, that I see myself in him. I hadn't, in, in chronological order of watching the series, I've talked about it at this point, I think. I think it's it's come up at some point that I that I relate a little bit to him. I may have cut it out every time I've brought it up, but this was when I first figured it out. And it makes sense that it took me this long to figure it out, because honestly, the character of Steve and I have very little in common on the surface. He was super popular. He had, he was an athlete. He was, came from a very wealthy family. He dated a lot and I'm none of those things. And I think now, even all this time later, I think I project a little bit onto Steve because I think my, my interpretation of him is that he ha carries a lot of insecurity, but that he dealt with it in a very different way than I dealt with my insecurity. Hmm. And those two things come from very different sources, I think. Maybe that's true of the character, but that's that's just how I read him. I don't know that I have any textual evidence to back that up, but I see a lot of myself in his moments of cowardice, which is ironic given the fact that one of the things I like so much about the character, like separately from myself, is that he has these moments of just absolute self-sacrifice. Like he throws himself in front of danger for people. Mm -hmm. And that's not something that I do. But I see that as a very aspirational thing in him. So in this moment, I think what I, when I say that I, I feel like I made it about Steve and I made it about me was partly because these things were starting to click. But in terms of why it hit me so hard, this is what my negative self-talk feels like. I didn't even, I wasn't even aware that it was there until very, like within the last couple of years. And a lot of that is because of this moment. This was when I figured out that i that I do this to myself. And I think that, a, I mean, a lot of us do this, but I, I wasn't aware I was doing that. And so it was like seeing this person who I was figuring out as it was happening, that I relate to him, that I see myself in this person, this, this kid who has this beat up face, who has been beaten down both verbally and physically all season, all three seasons, but especially this season, to then have Robin, a person named Robin, saying to him, 
again, the way I experienced it on first watch, I don't hold to this anymore, but it seemed, it, it, I experienced it as her just going through, you're just this awful person and you, you were this awful person and I've held this against you and you, I can't get past that and this is always how I'm going to see you and you can't outlive these mistakes that you've made and these, these ways that you used to be and this person that you really are and you're, this was how I was hearing it. And so the reason I feel bad about that in hindsight is because I wasn't hearing all of, I wasn't hearing Robin's perspective. So I do now, but that was what jumped out at me. But what I have since figured out and why this scene is so important in terms of whether I selfishly viewed it at the time or not, what it may has made me realize is that what me becoming and being so defensive and so protective of Steve as a character, I realize I have all of these words of encouragement and support and defense and protectiveness on his behalf. And it's like, well, if I'm saying that about Steve, that means I'm saying that at least in some capacity about myself. Mm -hmm. And that's been a really big deal. Yeah. And I think what that says to me is on a much broader scale is that I think this is why fandom is important. It, it has the potential to do this. This has had a very real world, real life impact on me. It's It's helped me work past some of that. And that goes for Stranger Things as a whole. That's not even just Steve. So when when I kind of thought through a lot of this, it's made me very appreciative of the show as a whole. And I think that's part of the reason I've become so fixated on this show. You know, I stand by the criticisms we've had over the course of these three hmm. seasons, but I'm very grateful for this show. I'm very grateful for all of the writers that have contributed to particularly to, char to Steve's characterization. And then also to the Duffers for, for casting Carrie, for listening to his, to his perspective and and his ideas and then to carry himself like it's just it's something that I'm yeah this scene is very it's a very personal very 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 personal scene for me still you know but I love the way it concludes I just yeah. it's a really beautiful scene yeah that speech even the first time I heard it it didn't strike me the way it struck you it wasn't personal for me and the way it was personal for you but even when she was saying like your hair was stupid and you got crumbs on the floor and you asked dumb questions. I didn't take that as her saying, I can never get past these things that you did. I already knew that she had mm -hmm. just because of the friendship that they had formed over the course of the season. So I think it's it's interesting to me and, and not in a like I'm not criticizing your reading, et cetera, et cetera. Like I just think it's really interesting that even in that moment where I was like, I don't know that I fully understand what's going on here. She's just saying, this is how I did see you. But I didn't feel that she was saying, this is how I do see you. Later, like days later, like thinking about this scene and the it was the look on his face. Like when she says a lot, because a lot of the coverage is on Steve reacting to mm -hmm. what she's saying. And it's, he looks so sad. Yeah. Like, there's so much of, like, I did that to you. And mm -hmm. I think that speaks to how I think of my own mistakes. They just, and I think this is true of a lot of us with, who struggle with anxiety. Like, sometimes our mistakes just live with us. And I think that's what I see in him right there. Like, because when she says, I would go home and scream into my pillow, he's like, because of me. But not because of him. Because he didn't string Tammy Thompson along. Tammy Thompson had a crush on Steve entirely without Steve's participation. <laughs> yeah. Okay? Yeah. So, yeah, she was mad at Steve because she was jealous. Steve did not do anything to her. Steve not did, did not do anything to Tammy. Mm -hmm. He was just existing and she resented him because he represented everything that she wished she was in terms of being attractive to Tammy Thompson. And so she's like picking him apart. Like, how can you be attracted to this guy who gets crumbs everywhere? And how can you be attracted to this guy who clearly didn't read the book and is now asking a question about whether the King of France is related to like a polar bear? She's just like, why? Why him? Right. You know, and that's very different from, for example, if he had dated Tammy Thompson and then cheated on her with Nancy or, you know. So I think like his his crimes were not 
that he had done something wrong. It was just that, yeah. Like, everything you just said is true. It's like, so me realizing that's the lens that I'm looking at this through. That's the lens that I look through, look at myself through. So that's why I say, like, when it, when I say it kind of changed my life, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. Because it's made me look back and see the ways that I've been so hard on myself in ways that weren't my fault. And having these, like, protective reactions, like, to don't pun it, don't keep punishing him. He could, he, he was, like, what happens in a few scenes of, like, Dustin giving him shit for telling them his name when he was drugged and he's like i was drugged and he's like so you take it like a man like you you resist it like he physically couldn't resist robin could for whatever reason which pissed me off in that episode that for some reason her resistance is higher okay so steve gets to be the bad guy again but it's all all of that it's like he couldn't help it yeah it's not his fault and those words are there they're they're pre-loaded into my psyche at this point so it's been a really, really helpful experience. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, when watching it the first time, yeah, you're right. I needed a minute. <laughs> yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah, I was, that was a lot. And I didn't even fully understand what I just experienced. It yeah, was like, yeah, there yeah. was a lot happening. Also, <laughs> I do love Dustin's, okay, what the hell? Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> especially like Erica's disgusted look when mm-hmm. they laugh. <laughs> After that, Billy shows up at big at the big buy. I totally thought it was the Terminator mm, at yeah. first. Looks over the left behind mess and he smells the blood. I thought he was gonna taste it. I, and did I was too. about to gag. Yeah. Gross. And it makes his pupils dilate, accompanied by that screeching sound, which I guess spreads the information to the rest of the hive mind. Don't ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> Murray and Alexi discuss the intricacies of the key and the lock, which establishes the danger of blowing up the machine, and then they decide to go explore the fun fair, regardless of what Hopper said. And that's where, as you mentioned in the beginning, where they talk about America and the rigged games, and yeah. then Murray buys some tickets. How about it? How about it? Hopper and Joyce, meanwhile, find Karen and Ted, who join them on the Gravitron, to see if they can figure out where the kids are. And as the ride starts, Joyce and Hop hold hands. Just so much nope about this. I just, I hate the Gravitron as a Raza concept. I just, I hate it. But I pretty much like everything in that scene. Yeah. We catch the end of Back to the Future, and then the Scoops troops sneak out of the bathroom to merge into the leaving crowd. Although I did find it kind of funny that, like, what, no one's going to notice Steve with this, like, massive injury on his face. And blood and puke all over his shirt. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're planning to just sneak out, get on the bus, and go home. Until Steve confesses, this is when he confesses that the, he gave the Russians Dustin's full name, and Dustin says he should have he should have fought it. You take it like a man, and I do. I don't. I don't like. I don't like this exchange at all. No, it just seems odd to have it come from Dustin. Like, yeah, especially having had him just analyze that he was drugged. Yeah, it feels like we we could have gotten instead his usual like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, or some variation of that. Or oh my god, my mom. Mm-hmm. While they argue, though, Rob, that's when Robinson notices the Russian guard by the exit, and they backtrack. With the really thick <laughs> Russian accent and the, like, paramilitary <sighs> outfit interviewing mall people. Bruh. Yeah. My pretty head is worried. Yeah. It should not be. No, but Alexi, meanwhile, wins big at the carnival games, and he impresses the crowd and us, let's be honest, but, and he wins a giant stuffed Woody the Woodpecker. But just as he's sharing the good news with Murray, everything slows down, and the Terminator appears. And then nothing happens. Anyway, <laughs> moving right along. Yeah, I'm not happy about this. No, I fully skipped the scene. I get it. Actually, no, I take that back. I don't get it. I'm at a point in this show where... It seems like every season we have to have a sacrificial lamb. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm still salty about Barb. I'm still salty about Bob. Why Why do we keep doing this? And I don't necessarily feel that it furthers the plot in any way to kill Alexi. Like, we already know what the fucking stakes are. I wonder if it's something similar to how, I didn't mention it, but how I feel about some of the stuff early on in the season where it's just getting people into position. Because we get three, I mean, technically Hopper doesn't actually die, but before we got that reveal in that teaser from January of 2020, when we saw that Hopper was still alive, three characters go down. Mm -hmm. I would have pitched Alexi living and working with Owens. Because, you know, Owens is the anti-Renner, and Alexi is the anti-Bond villain. (laughs) 
I'm just I'm just leaning into that reference. I call Gr- Grigori the Terminator. Come on. Yeah. So like to have them work together, dude. That's good. Would have been really really good. That's such a good point. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm keeping Alexi. They oh he survived and Owens just put him in pr- witness protection and he's fine. Placey's mom. Because I think in 2019 our reaction was like no no yeah this this isn't this isn't happening. What? Like, it was a lot of that. Yeah. And not in a good way. We get Murray's reaction, and then he just happens to find Hopper and Joyce right when they're getting off the Gravitron, which is very convenient. And he's like, they got Alexi, they got Alexi. And this thus begins the chase and face off between Hop and Grigori, which I don't really feel like going through the details. No, the one thing I did want to say about that scene is that I feel like when they're in the fun house with all the mirrors and everything, I'm pretty sure that's a reference to something like an 80s. It's not a horror movie because I've seen it. (laughs) (laughs) So we can pretty safely say it's not a horror movie. It's like some kind of like action film or something. Like it doesn't look like it's copied, but it looks like really familiar. But Google was not being my friend, so I couldn't find it. But it it's a pretty scene. Like that sequence when they're in the Hall of Mirrors is like cool looking. Mm-hmm. But the fight scene itself, I feel super ambivalent about. I think I would have felt a lot better if Hop had actually just killed the man. For real. And... It makes perfect sense that, you know, Terminator Man would be wearing a bulletproof vest. It does. And I know nothing about guns. And I'm, like, kind of proud about knowing nothing about guns. But I do know that you cannot actually get hit with a bulletproof vest and then just be like, all right, let's go. It stops the bullets from killing you. It stops them from entering your body. But you get massive welts. You can still have internal bleeding. Mm -hmm. It's a protector, not a preventer of injury so yes i understand that terminator is terminator but it just seems stupid it also seems stupid that hop like knowing that this man is a cross between the terminator and darth vader would not go for a headshot yeah and especially when hop is like basically right on top of him has enough time to shoot him multiple times i pretty much made the exact same face that hopper makes when he sees gregory get back up like he just has this like for real and it's like yeah no i'm right there with you hop because it's like is this guy unkillable and then that's the part of the frustration is like we don't know enough about him he's not interesting in this like because i was thinking he might even have around the same amount of screen time that brenner does yeah but i mean if you compare the, the presentation of those two characters well or even if you compare him to the terminator yeah there's just more stuff around the characters that make them interesting he doesn't feel threatening enough to be like really worried about him but he also isn't like like i'm kind of surprised that they took him as seriously as they did because i feel like it might have that might have actually been one area where having him be a little bit goofy like kind of a doofus yeah like almost not quite but like sort of like robotic and in the same sense of like he just kind of bumbles through things I, I don't know that I'd have liked that a lot better, but it would have felt at least more uh, fitting for the season in some ways. But I do agree with you. It is pretty. And actually, when he scoops up the, the, the walkie that's just, like, spewing all that Russian, that actually felt very... Season one hopper. Well, it did. I was going to say it actually felt very diehard because it made me think of, like, uh, now... Because he gets the gun, too, and he says, yeah. now I have a machine gun. Yeah. You know, it made me think of that, yeah. that bit. Yeah, you're not wrong. With Hans Gruber. And in a way that works a lot better and it's more subtle than, say, when they basically copied that exchange from Die Hard in Chapter 5. Eventually they reconvene because Hopper does send Joyce and Murray off to go get the car. Also, they just leave Alexi's body there, right? Mm-hmm. No, it's fine. He didn't die. He was resting. Oh, he also had a sugar crash. You know. This is true. He he ate a lot of junk. It happens to the best of us. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But also, Joyce takes the the moment to go beat up Larry Klein on the way out. I think because I had the subtitles on, I actually caught this time that there's somebody in the background who goes, yeah, lady. Oh, really? (laughs) Oh, that's great. (laughs) The only thing when they're getting away and, and Hop asks about Alexi... And then looks sad. That felt unearned to me. Mm. He called him Smirnoff when they got there. And he has been really pretty awful to Alexi the entire time. Yeah. And then I thought, well, maybe it's because he's like, damn it, our our source is gone. And then I thought, that feels too cold for Hopper. Yeah, I mean, maybe he's feeling like, oh, shit, maybe I shouldn't have been such a jerk to him all this time. But eh. I like that read a lot better than mm. either of mine. So we'll, I'll take it. Yeah. 
When he hands the walkie up to Murray to translate, he, as we see, that they've located the kids in the lower level of Starcourt, which of course sets them up for why they're going to go there in in the finale. But uh, that prompts us to swing back to Starcourt, which is empty. And the Russians are closing in on this group's troops hiding spot. But the car alarm goes off. Thank you, Elle. And she and the rest of the team appear on the upper level just before she hurls the car across the food court. Just like, such a mood, you know? Yep. Good job, Elle. Yeah. Scoop's troop emerge after the Russians are all d- dead, I'm guessing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and our two groups reconvene. And there's that great hug between Dustin, Elle, and Mike. Yes. And then everyone just hurtles through their explanations to get one another up to speed. That actually works in this scene. It does. Because... The characters don't have time. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, it's a, it's a, the big, big monster coming. Let's Russians. Go. What Russians? Well, the Russians, yeah. they built their, they have a base under Starcourt. What do you mean? Well, oh, is, well, that explains the gate. What about the gate? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who's on first? Yeah, uh, pretty much. I mean, well, like, my favorite thing about the whole scene is L, naturally. But my second favorite thing is Robin being like, uh, <laughs> wait, what, how, wh- car <laughs> and steve's just like she's got powers keep up <laughs> yeah and robin doesn't even go like she looks confused but she believes it and she doesn't like you know ask like questions and whatnot well and i love the i, I kind of i don't know what to i i don't know what to make of this but i kind of love nancy's like and who are you yeah. <laughs> and she's like i work with steve like she's unfazed yeah i don't read that like as nancy's jealous or anything or like no but she's a new person but I, but I, I i don't know but there's a part of me that kind of likes the idea that she's a little bit like um why are you bringing in new people yeah <laughs> is she vetted yeah i, I just thought that was cute mm-hmm. speaking of l she is uh not she detaches from the group and she starts to hear the ringing in her ears before she keels over And when they all rush over, she says, my leg, because her wound has grown, looks properly nasty and dangerous, and something is alive and writhing under her skin. She screams. We cut to black, fully primed for the finale to come. Yeah. When I got to this point, I wondered if if Billy Billy Flair, like, smelling the blood, if that screech that we heard, like, had anything to do with this? Like, if it, like, activated? I mean, probably not, because you made the thing connection, and that's obviously what they were doing i think that's makes way more sense but it just Mm. occurred to me if that was like connected somehow or unless that was just in in the big buy he was just like i'm mad like uh, or whatever have the scent because i would always assume that it was just a piece left behind of the bigger monster that that grabbed her because that is kind of his deal Mm -hmm. but it struck me that maybe there's another aspect to it but but yeah that's the end of the episode so final thoughts huh I had to fight so hard not to watch the next episode. In fact, I think I let it, like, go through. Like, the cold open hadn't started before. I was like, no, no, Roku, go go back to the home screen. But I was really, really tempted to just go ahead and watch the finale because, I mean, it does end on a cliffhanger, but I know exactly what happens because I've already seen the next episode. But it's one of those that flows really, really naturally into the next episode. Yeah, it was it was definitely tempting. Yeah, I actually had very much the same the same reaction. It was like, wow, yeah, that f- you you feel the flow of it, and it's it's been a while since we've had a proper cliffhanger like that. Yeah, which is gonna be which actually kind of begs the question. I wonder what we can expect from whatever the final chapter is of part one in season four, mm-hmm. because I wonder if they're gonna leave it on a big cliffhanger like that. Probably, it would not surprise me. Yeah, but then. They have such a solid fan base at this point, and they have such a good way of making things feel compelling that I don't know that they necessarily will have to rely on that. Mm. But obviously this episode, it contains uh, probably the most meaningful scene for me in all of the series. But I don't know that I love the episode as a whole, like, to that degree. Yeah. That scene stands really well on its own, I think, regardless even of my, like, personal connection with it. But I... uh, talking through a lot of it it's interesting because it the thing i think that we've landed on is just like how much we still don't have by mm-hmm. this point in the series the fact that you have we're we're at the penultimate of what was all of the series for a long time mm-hmm. and how yeah we don't we still have a lot of mi- uh, question marks about what exactly to expect in the finale yeah and yeah we're building towards character deaths that don't feel necessary at the same time, I think that Str- one of Stranger Things' biggest strengths 
is that it tends to introduce pretty rockin' characters. Yeah. If they have, like, an active part to play, they generally tend to be pretty good. Uh, the Terminator and the Russian general are probably the least interesting of any new characters, but, like... Which is one of the reasons that they stand out. Yes, precisely. Because you think about Alexi, you think about Murray, you think about Max and Billy and Owens. Like, uh, they, they are really good at, ca- at new characters. And so the problem with that is that then the cast just swells. Mm-hmm. And so I wonder if they're like, we just can't keep adding to the roster. Yeah. They're going to do that in four. Because that they're good at it, why wouldn't they? But I, I, th- I wonder if that contributes. And they're just like, we gotta, can't, we can't introduce new people because, you know, Bob was great. Mm-hmm. But again, if Jopper is Endgame, you can't have him around. Yeah. Granted, I don't think he needed to kill Bob for that. But whatever. Yeah. But I, I, I wonder if that's kind of where some of their motivation comes from. Yeah. I think it's a little misguided, if that's the case. Mm -hmm. We have a really good cast. I don't, uh, you know, cast of characters and then cast of actors. Like, I don't know that you need to keep adding to the the roster, but yeah. So, with that said, that's going to conclude our contemplation on Chapter 7, The Bite. If you've got comments, questions, thoughts, you can join the conversation. We're on Instagram as at Coffee and Contemplation Pod and TikTok as at Coffee and Hawkins. Like, share, subscribe, wherever you get your podcasts. And consider leaving us a review. Thanks for listening. Over and out. Independence Day. There's a bunch of aliens, and they're just mean as catch it. As, as my mom would say. <laughs> That's a great expression. <laughs> wow. Um, I mean, catch it is mean, dude. Like, it stinks. I love cats, but come on, man. <laughs> There's no yeah. use yeah. for it. You just gotta get rid of it. Um, so, anyway. True of most shit, I would say. <laughs> yeah, it's fair. So there's these aliens, man, and they're just mean. Because Billy shows up later. Billy Flair yeah, yeah, shows yeah, up yeah. later and then sniffs um, it and then, you know. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> you have to leave that in. <laughs> <laughs> like my sound effects? Yes. Um. <laughs>